So in this tutorial, we'll be exploring a slightly more advanced image data set called uh, the horses versus humans data set. And also we'll be looking at how best to organize um, an external data set using image generators and also potentially prevent overfitting using image data augmentation. So we'll be dealing with a binary classification problem uh, because the data set that we're using is the horses versus humans. So the first thing we'll do is import all our necessary files. Uh, the next thing we'll do is download our horses versus humans data set. So we'll download the train data set um, and the validation data set. And um, you can find the zip files corresponding to the train and validation data sets by clicking on uh, the links here. So once we download the zip files for the train and the validation data set, you should find the zip files on the left panel, one for train and one for validation. Then we go ahead and extract these zip files and link them to uh, corresponding directories. So uh, once you execute these two cells, you should uh, find the train directory as well as the validation directory. And when you go inside one of these two directories, you'd see two subdirectories corresponding to our two labels or our two classes. So we have the horses subdirectory and we have the human subdirectory. And you'd have the same for the validation directory as well. And within these subdirectories, you'd find the various uh, images corresponding to those classes. Um, and these are just some of the sample image uh, file names that we have in these four subdirectories. So question one, what's the best directory structure to store an image data set for a classification task? Um, so the best directory structure would be to have a separate directory for your train, validation, and test. In this case, we have one only for train and validation. Uh, and then within these directories, you'd have subdirectories corresponding to each class. So here we have uh, a horses subdirectory and a human subdirectory, and you'd have the corresponding images within that. So for example, if we were to externally uh, port our MNIST data set, we would have 10 subdirectories corresponding to each digit as the subdirectory name. Next, um, we display some example images. So I've just defined uh, a user-defined function to display, to read the file path and display the image. So this is an example of a horse. So we can see that uh, these are 300 plus 300 colored images with uh, some background artifacts. And the same goes for an example human image. So since we saw that these images are actually slightly more advanced in the sense that they're colored and they have some background artifacts, we'll make our model or we'll design our model um, to be slightly more complex. So we have four pairs of con 2D and max pooling 2D layers. Um, we followed by a flatted, followed by two hidden dense layers and then finally our output layer with one neuron uh, because it's a binary classification problem. And the activation that we'll be using since we're using only one neuron is the sigmoid activation function. So here, uh, one thing to notice is that I've defined the input shape as 100 cross 100. Um, even though the original images are 300 cross 300. Um, so in a sense, we are expecting the images to our model to be 100 cross 100. So we'll have to resize them before feeding them into the model. So, and that is something that we will do um, very soon. So question two, how does the output layer activation function vary for binary and multi-class classification tasks? Um, right, so for binary, we usually have one output neuron followed by the sigmoid activation function. Uh, in some cases, you could have two and followed by a softmax activation function. And then for multi-class, uh, you would always have uh, output neurons equal to the number of classes and then followed by a softmax activation function. 
here we have uh, a summary of our model layers um, and the corresponding output shapes and the number of learnable parameters. Now that we've designed our model, uh, we define our optimizer. We'll be using the RMS prop, which is another adaptive learning based uh, optimizer. We'll be using the binary cross entropy loss and uh, we'll go ahead and compile our model. So now that our model is ready, before we um, train our model, we need to uh, define um, our it our uh, train set and our validation set. So for a few things, one, um, a way to invoke or a way to organize our data as well as bring about some augmentation um, into our training, we use uh, the image data generator class. So the first thing we do is create an object of this class and we define some augmentation parameters. So in this section one, we'll be training without any augmentation. So uh, we'll go ahead and comment out these parameters. But essentially the object of this class is gonna define some augmentation parameters that you could apply during training. And next we use um, the class method called flow from directory that is essentially taking images from uh, the given path. So the path that we've given here is the training data set. So take images from there, resize them to 100 cross 100 because our model expects it to be 100 cross 100. We batchify them in batches of 128 images each. And we also define a class mode as binary because we're using a binary classification problem. So now this becomes your training set or your train generator. We do the same for validation. Uh, for our validation data set, we will only define the rescale parameter, which is essentially your normalization. And then define your generator that uh, takes images or as the name suggests, flows images from the given path, uh, resizes them to 100 cross 100 and uh, defines your class mode as binary. So once we run the cell, we see that um, we have around 1,027 training images and we have 256 validation images. So question three, what is the purpose of image generators? Uh, it has two main purposes. One, um, it's a way to feed data from an external data set into your model. So it essentially creates a training pipeline. And second, it also allows you to define some augmentation parameters that can be applied to the images in the training pipeline. And the reason uh, we are using augmentation is to uh, prevent overfitting to our training data set. So here uh, we haven't defined any augmentation parameters because we've commented out um, the parameters. So we'll be looking at how our model does without any augmentation. So the next thing we do is go ahead and train our model using model.fit. Uh, we do that on our train generator and our validation data corresponds to our validation generator. And we train our model for around 100 epochs. So this, uh, this would take some time, around 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, we notice very quickly that at around maybe the 36th epoch, our training accuracy hits 100%. So as you can see, it keeps hitting around 100%, but our validation accuracy is still only around 80%. So this is a clear indicator that our model is fitting to our train, overfitting to our training data, because it's getting a training accuracy of 100%, but it's not really able to generalize well to new data. Um, so this is a classic example of a model overfitting. In this cell, what you could do is just uh, evaluate your model. So once you run the cell, you see this tab that allows you to upload uh, an example image. So how you could do that is just go to the validation data set and maybe choose uh, a random horse image. Click on these three um, dots and you can download the image onto your local system. 
so when you click on choose files, uh, you can upload that downloaded image. And once you do that, it will predict whether it's a horse or a human. And um, so you could try this for a few images till you find an image that maybe um, does not work because we know that it works only 82% of the time. So there are definitely images in your validation data set that's been predicted wrong. So you could try out uh, multiple images and find an image that's predicted wrong. Uh, once you have that image, we will actually, this subsection actually visualizes uh, the sort of feature maps that our model learns at intermediate stages. So what we'll be doing is we'll, uh, as you know, our model has uh, a few pairs of convolution and max pooling layers. And at each stage, you have multiple feature maps stacked together. So at each stage, we'll be looking at five or the first five feature maps. Um, and we'll be looking at intermediate outputs after the first max pooling uh, and the corresponding convolution and max pooling layers. So we'll start over here and we'll uh, look at the output at around this stage. So we'll look at the feature maps um, at these intermediate stages. Yeah. So this is um, our image or the first five feature maps. Um, and they're around 49 cross 49. Then we apply the convolution, second convolution. Then we apply the second max pooling. So now it's reduced to about 24 cross 24. Again, this is now convolution on top. Then the, uh, the next max pooling layers, so we see the resolution has decreased followed by the next convolution, and then the final max pooling layer, where uh, our images now are around four cross four. So the thing to notice here is that um, once we reach this stage, the features that um, differentiate between a horse and a human um, don't really have to make sense to us humans the model picks up on few pixels that could possibly be the differentiating factor between humans and horses, but these need not make sense to us. Okay, so now in section two, we'll be doing the same thing only uh, with image, Im image augmentation. So question four, how does image augmentation help with respect to overfitting? Uh, the main idea behind image augmentation is that you're increasing the diversity of uh, the samples in your training data set or the number of samples in your training data set. So for example, the MNIST data set, we had only left facing boots. With image augmentation, you could also create right facing boots. Um, and then this could basically improve the diversity of your training data set. And now your model sees is trained on left and right. And um, as a result, would be able to generalize better to different kinds of boots. So uh, this is um, the same cell that we saw uh, previously, only that uh, we have uncommented uh, these parameters or these augmentation parameters. What these augmentation parameters actually mean uh, can be found on the doc documentation of image data generator. And I've uh, linked the documentation a few cells above. So we create our data, uh, train data gen with the corresponding augmentation parameters. And then we flow images from uh, the specified directory, resize them to 100 cross 100, and batchify them uh, into batches of 128 images each. We do the same for validation. Uh, we do not define augmentation parameters for our validation data set because it is a trick that's applied during training. You don't really have to augment them uh, during validation or during evaluation. So we have the same number of images and uh, we go ahead and train our model. So here we see uh, that our training accuracy is actually never hitting 100%. Um, it's still around 99, 97%. And um, our validation accuracy is slightly improved uh, because of uh, this image augmentation or because 
of the increased diversity in our training data set. So what you can infer from here is that uh, the training, the model is not overfitting to our training data. And uh, the difference between the training accuracy and the validation accuracy is slightly lesser, uh, implying that our model is able to generalize slightly better than our previous model. However, uh, we can definitely say that this is not a great model because our validation accuracy is still not um, extremely good. So question five, what do you observe about the training and validation accuracies when the model is trained with image augmentation? Um, this is exactly what we discussed a few minutes back. Let's predict again. Uh, this cell is um, similar as before. Once you run the cell, you'll see a tab to upload an image. Uh, you can upload an image from your local, uh, local system, and it should be able to predict whether it's a horse or a human. One thing you could try is uh, an image that was wrongly predicted in the previous section. Uh, you could try that out here and see if it uh, is correctly predicted now. Um, it It's not a guarantee because our validation accuracy is still not great. So, uh, but it is something that you could definitely try out. And finally, uh, we visualize the layers again. We visualize uh, the layers after the or the intermediate feature maps after the first max pooling layer up till the last max pooling layer. And uh, at each layer, you have multiple feature maps stacked, but we'll be visualizing only the first five. So again, this is the horse. And uh, the last feature map is of size four plus four. And even though these features might not make sense to us, um, these are the features that the model has learned to differentiate between horses and humans. 